Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about coroutines in C20, with a particular focus on generators and yielding values as opposed to asynchronous tasks and awaiting on results, although they are tightly linked in the new standard. Now, C is not the first language to get this kind of feature. If we look at the top 10 languages by GitHub activity, a number of them have stackless coroutines or some variation of them, such as what we see in C20. These include JavaScript, Python, obviously TypeScript, PHP, and C. -sharp. On the other hand, Go and Ruby have stack full coroutines or fibers in order to express concurrency, and Java is considering adding uh, fibers and continuations as well. Let's look at an example from JavaScript to get our feet wet. We have a generator function, which put a little star on the end here, and then we can yield values from a function. Whenever you yield a value, the function doesn't end. It just pauses until someone consumes that, and then control comes back into the function again. It's sort of an illusion that you get that you have control while somebody else really is controlling you. And this allows for simpler iteration over whatever kind of logic you want to have. In this case, it's very simple, yield one, yield two. And if I loop over the contents, I get one and two. And if I look at what's returned from this generator function, I find that it's an object of type generator, which is returned by generator function. Here's the documentation on Mozilla Developer Network, or MDN. And if we look at the iterable and iterator protocols, we see that an iterable provides an iterator. An iterator has a next function for iterating through the values. And that's what's returned from a generator function in JavaScript. Now, assuming we didn't have that feature built into JavaScript these days and want to compile modern JavaScript to an older version, here's an example of how we might do that. When the generator function gets compiled to old JavaScript, instead of yielding values, we see it returns a function. And this function needs a context to know where it is in the next part of its iteration. And to try to point out the relationship between asynchronous await and generator functions, we find that we can also implement this await feature in terms of the generator feature. Another language worth looking at briefly for examples of the yield feature is C sharp. And their syntax here is yield return. Note that when you create a generator function, the main point they describe here is that using yield to define an iterator removes a need for an explicit extra class that holds the state for the enumeration. This kind of state that's stored in this A, for example, in JavaScript here. And this enumerable interface that it creates for us provides an enumerator. And the enumerator allows us to iterate over and get the values in the enumeration. And these are interfaces where a particular implementation is created automatically to satisfy the needs of the generator function that you have. And briefly discussing this issue of the relationship between await and yield, we note that the new C20 standard says that co-yield, which is their syntax, is equivalent to co-await calling yield value on the promise in question. And beyond that, we're not going to look further into await today. I got this standard document, by the way, from the C++ draft repo on GitHub. And they also have another example in the draft, which is a full example you can actually compile and run of how to create your own generator function. Here's our example, yield1, yield2, just like we saw in JavaScript earlier. The difference being in C++, that there's no standard generator class. Instead, you create your own, and you tell it that you're going to return uh, an instance of that type. And that's how it knows what kind of generator to create to store the state of your iteration. And notice here that yield value that we saw earlier. So let's try this example out. Here, I've copied and pasted this example into VS Code. Only I've changed include coroutine to experimental coroutine and standard coroutine handle or standard suspend always to standard experimental because the current implementations I have, whether in MSVC or Clang, uh, do not yet have it under the top level namespace. Presumably that's coming in the future. But other than that, this is exactly a copy and paste from the C20 spec. In terms of how I'm building this, I've downloaded the latest Clang 10 binaries from the LLVM website. And I've hacked it here also so that instead of using the system includes, and libraries. I'm using the includes and libraries from that download because otherwise I did not have access to the coroutine libraries. And if we run it, we see that it says one, two. 
where we've iterated over saying move next. Notice that function name looks an awful lot like the one in C-sharp. But again, this right here is dependent on how I've defined my generator. If my generator were defined using the iterator protocols of C++, then I could have used a for each loop over this instead. And moving forward, I'm actually gonna show an example of doing this. And instead of implementing my own generator, I'm going to use this Lewis S. Baker CPP Coro implementation instead. It's a library of C++ coroutine abstraction designed for the coroutine spec. And it has a number of implementations of things you might want to do with coroutines, including generator, which notice is a templated type so I can generate anything I want to, and it does what we expect it would do. If we make a generator that yields values, then we can consume those values in a loop. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm also, for my example, I'm going to use a relatively large file from the GeoNames website. You can download things here, including what I'm going to be using is the Cities 500, which is a list of all the cities in the world that they keep track of with at least 500 people in them. And there is a specification for this uh, tab delimited file. And I'm going to be looking at the latitude and population fields when I'm doing my demo. Now in terms of this uh, data set, it looks like we might expect, we already saw, we have a latitude on here, and we also have population on here. And those are the ones we're gonna be pulling out for our demo. And so here's what our demo looks like. It says that we want to load the file, and we're gonna keep track of the population south of the equator, and the total population of these cities that are listed in the file. And I don't know if these cities have any overlap, like could the same person be counted twice? There are definitely people missing, but we'll get what we get and it'll be a little bit of fun. As you know, if you've watched my channel much, I like geography matters, so it's sort of a fun topic. So we're gonna loop over the rows in the file and we're gonna see if the latitude is uh, south of the equator, then we're gonna add to the population for the south and we're gonna keep track of the total population of all of these cities as well. And also to keep track of things, we'll see how many total rows we've read out of the file. And just for reference, this file here is 30 megabytes in size. So the first implementation I'm going to do is going to be relatively simple. And we're gonna ignore both efficiency and new C++ features. So this is what it might look like if I were gonna do a naive implementation. I'm going to return a vector of vectors which is gonna give me all the rows and all the cells in each row and the string content of those cells. And so I can create a vector here and I can loop across my file and I can split into my cells and then push it onto the back of my vector and off we go. Now there may be a number of better implementations than this. This is gonna be horribly inefficient of course. This is just a relatively simple naive implementation I might do if I'm not going to a lot of effort to get my job done. And if I run this version here, along with user bin time dash v, I'm going to see that I get near over 3 billion people total with over 400 million in the Southern Hemisphere. And also I get to see that it took me about 0.4 seconds to run, had a maximum resident memory of over 100 megabytes because, among other things, I've loaded all the data up in RAM here. Now this might be inefficient for certain needs, and if I were doing actual real big data, we can imagine this getting out of hand really quickly. So let's try another implementation. Let's still forget we had C++ 20 coroutines, and we're going to do a manual effort of iterating through the file instead, but one thing at a time more efficiently. So in order to do this, here's my read rows function, and it will create an instance of row reader. Remember we how we had to have some kind of data to store the state of our iteration. And we ha can have begin and end to conform to iterator protocols in C++. And I need to keep track of my input stream, and I need to keep track of my current values that I have for the, for the current row. And I need to have a buffer here for storing data from a line into. The idea being that if I have this preset buffer and I'm using string views to come out, and I'm providing them through an iterator, then I won't have to pre-allocate an entire array of arrays all in advance just so I can iterate through them. And so I can return my iterator from begin and end, and my relatively generic iterator still needs to be able to say things like, when is the iteration finished? How do I get the value out? 
and how do I increment through this iteration process? And there may be a better way to do it than this, but this is the implementation I threw together. Obviously, there's a lot of effort to go to, and even if I had this as a handy tool on hand, the fact that I still need to keep track of watching out for events coming at me from outside and keeping track of state in an awkward fashion here still takes more effort than what I had if I just wrote a simple function. But if we run this version, we see A, that it runs faster, and B, that we've used less than two megabytes of RAM in this version of the implementation. So the question is, how can we get something that's as convenient as this, but as efficient as this? And that's where generator functions come in. We'll go to our third implementation, which is using C++ 20 coroutines. So in fact, actually, if you notice, it's a little bit smaller than this version because we don't need to keep track of this extra vector anyway. We're going to return a CPP coro. Remember, this is the library we're using from GitHub over here, which has implemented, implemented generator as so. A little more detailed than example from the C++ 20 spec. And I can generate const references to vector of string view here. And I can yield these out one at a time. No, also I could do any other control logic I wanted here as well in the process of yielding these values. So come back over here to our main program and include the coroutine version of it. Notice I've not changed any of my code here otherwise. Let's see what happens. We get it running pretty much just the same as it did before under the custom iterator that I wrote. Except again now, I have a nice little program where I can express the control flow that I want to, and I still get efficient implementation for iterating through values. So I hope this has been fun, and I hope to look at asynchronous operations in C++20 in the future. And I also hope we get a chance to talk about how coroutines work across a variety of languages too. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe. Bye, y'all.